please lift up our voices for how great thou art. Please be seated. And let us pray our unison prayer together. Heavenly Father, 
whose son demonstrated greatness as the surrendering of self and service to others. Humble our feelings of self-exaltation, that we may become effective servants of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. I encourage everyone to read from Job chapter 38, verses 1 through 7, and from Psalm 104, verses 1 through 9, verse 24 and 35. I will be sharing with you from Hebrews 5, verses 1 through 10, and from the Gospel of Mark, which we have been following, chapter 10, verses 35 through 45. Hear now the word of the Lord. Every high priest chosen from among mortals is put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is subject to weakness. And because of this, he must offer sacrifice for his own sins as well as for those of the people. And one does not presume to take this honor, but takes it only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And now for the gospel. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And Jesus said to, him, to them, What is it that you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, you know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. May God add his richest blessings to the reading and the hearing of his holy, holy word. Please join us as you are able, and please stand, for all hail the power of Jesus' name.
Please be seated. In Mark's Gospel that we had just heard, the last portion of Scripture, we can kind of hear it with indignation about James and John, the sons of Zebedee, because it looks like they are letting their blind ambition go to take Jesus aside, to ask him for places of high honor, to be seated at Jesus' left and right hand. Uh, that sort of sounds like any of us sort of would when the other ten finally heard what was going on. Uh, at least James and John did take Jesus aside to do it privately, but you know how private things are. Uh, things get out, and it certainly got out, and the other ten were indignant with James and John. But as I often preached on this, I came and wanted to maybe approach it at a different angle. Because sometimes we do not fully understand what lies in people's heart. And therefore, sometimes we need to read just a little bit more in order to get the full story. Because a few verses before this one that we had in our lesson, the dis uh, Mark records that the disciples were afraid. I mean, after all, this is the third discourse that they would have heard where Jesus tells them that he is going to suffer and die. Um, and the disciples hear that. So there has to be an amount of fear that is taking over in each of the disciples as they may not fully understand what Jesus was fully saying, but yet they were wondering if Jesus, if this is going to happen to their master, what will happen to them? And therefore, it gives new life to maybe the question that James and John wanted to, to ask. Maybe they were just trying to secure a future for them. Maybe they wanted some assurance 
amidst Jesus' predictions of suffering and death, that everything will be all right. They, maybe they were just simply afraid. And this is how their fear came out. Now, we can identify with the disciples' fear quite easily. We have all been through some frightening decisions, even as a, an, an individual, but even as a nation, for the sake of security. Fear is a powerful emotion, and it can cause us to forget our compassion, and it can ramp up our judgment processes. Fear can paralyze us into inaction, and it can tempt us to quit. As we sit here in a culture that is increasingly less interested in organized religion, it can be easy to fear for the future of the church. And as I said, prior to our services today, even the fear of what is going to happen in the divisions of the United Methodist Church. Can we really blame James and John for wanting a little reassurance that things will work out? Don't we want reassurance that all will be okay? And there's a way that we can handle that. Jesus' response to them is that they will drink the cup that he will drink from. And they will also be baptized with the baptism upon which he is and has been baptized. They will have to go and face the same struggles and the fears and the uh, uh, fear of death uh, that Jesus faced. And all that Jesus has been, he will pass that on to his disciples, and they will walk. As they said, we can handle that. But Jesus reassures them that he will be with them. Jesus reassures them that he will be with them no matter what. Now, there are some out there who believe that if you follow Jesus, if you follow God, if you keep all the rules, everything is fine and dandy. Uh, the uh, story of Job is one of those where uh, all of Job's friends said, uh, as he had been blessed, God is certainly with you. But when illness came and, and, and despair and terror, it was, what did you do to God? You must have sinned. Well, that was not the case. It happened. It happened. But for those that think that you will never experience pain, that thinking is just plain wrong. It is harmful, and it is certainly dangerous. Jesus was God's own son, and he wound up dying <coughs> on the cross. Who are we to think that our fates should be any better? Now, in our reading from Hebrews this morning that we just also just heard, it is said, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries <coughs> and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. The writer from Hebrews is lifting Jesus up as an example for all of us Christians to follow. We are to follow Christ into submission. Now, submission is not a word that is popular <coughs> in our culture today. We rather hear, don't we, stand on your own two feet, pull yourself up. Our understanding of toughness is not faith in God, nor trusting in God's presence or providence. Rather, it is sort of like a quarterback who leaves the fourth quarter comeback with a broken nose or being wounded in the leg or the hand. Or a cowboy, if you uh, remember um, uh, uh, 
Well, yeah, I mean, not, not just John Wayne, but uh, Paul Newman and Butch Cassidy. Butch Cassidy, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, uh, where uh, you you are, are those cowboys and you're facing extraordinary odds at the end. You're wounded in despair, and yet you still go out into that crowd with guns blazing, thinking that you will be able to succeed. Yeah. We don't like loud cries, and we don't like tears. We like suck it up. But as Christians, as followers of the one who submitted not just to being human, but to the cross, we are called to enter into pain and suffering, into grief and loss to be present with each other just as God is present with us. To do that, to practice that ministry of presence both with our pain and that and, and of the pain of our brothers and sisters in Christ requires us to surrender, to surrender our self-confidence, to surrender our self-reliance, to surrender our independence, and to submit to the confidence in God. Reliance upon God and interdependence with each other. In 1896, Judson Deventer wrote the lyrics to that classic hymn, I Surrender All. He said, all to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him, in his presence daily live. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. The mentor said that this hymn came about as he was struggling to find his path in life. He was trying to question whether to serve his gifts for the, for the arts or to become an evangelist. When he finally submitted, not to his desires, to his own desires, but to God's will, he explained that the whole world opened up to him. It is a mystery of faith that to lose one's life is to gain it. This is a hard task. Submission is not popular, but it is in submission that Christ found his glory. Following the path of Christ will have both joy and pain, suffering and exaltation. Jesus, God's own son, the one whom we come to know as God incarnate, God made flesh, died on a cross. God refused to be separated from humanity, to be separated from us. So God became one of us and lived among us and even suffered and died on the cross for us. The testimony of the cross is that even in our darkest hour, even when it appears that all hope is lost, even when fear threatens to cripple us, God is with us. We should never try to limit God. Indeed, God is with us in our darkest hours in multitude of ways. But the one best way that we experience God among us is through the body of Christ. That is the people who gather on a weekly basis to come to his table, to come to hear his word, to feed upon him, to be fed, and to go out and to be the Christ for our world. That is who we are called to be, the body of Christ. It is through us that God is with us. Now, this is only one way. This is not the only way, because God is with us and has shown us in many different ways. And sometimes it's through a card. Sometimes it's through an anonymous gift. 
Sometimes it's through a sign on the road that we see every day. But because we're looking for something, God speaks through that sign. Maybe it's through a rainbow. Maybe it's through a friend that has no idea but pats us on the back or holds our hand. It tells us that God is with us. It is through us that God is with us in one way. It is through us that God acts to hold us together. It is through us that God will not let us go. As the Apostle Paul wrote, he said, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. What this tells us is God will not let us go, no matter what may come. We will be present. We are asked to be present as the body of Christ for each other. We are asked to be the body of Christ for each other. And as we do so, may we share the love of God each and every day, just as it has been shared with us here in this house of worship or outside when we come to one who is godly, to one, to one that has been living a godly life and has shared their life and fellowship with us. Now we are asked to go to go out into the world as the body of Christ. We are to seek and to serve all people in the name of Jesus Christ. We are to go out into the world and to heal the sick, to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to comfort those who mourn, to free the captives, and to let all of the world know that the love of God cannot and will not be defeated. My friends, this is the voice of God that has come to us. God is with us. May we never forget that. God is with you. We are asked to be the body of Christ. Go now in his love and be that for a world that needs his presence so much. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we do come to you today. We come with many thoughts. We come with many fears. We come praising your name. We come with tears. Whatever we come with today, Lord, we come to you. And we know that your loving arms are around us and enabling us to face another week, to face another month, to face another year, and to face the years that lies ahead. We ask, Lord, that you will pour out your Spirit upon us, guiding us to be the body of Christ, that we may carry Christ in our hearts and that he may show through us to all that we come into contact with. We live in a broken world, but you have sent us to come and to heal, be at work through us, Lord that your glory may be shown, that your Son may be raised up as you had raised him up and provided for him life, your presence. And in that presence, 
He has poured out his spirit upon us to do the same, for he has shown us the way. Forgive us when we have been unforgiving. Create in us, Lord, a new heart, a heart of Christ, that we may go forward in love and fellowship in tears and in sorrow, but also with joy and exaltation of knowing who we are and whose we are. We give you thanks for this congregation, Lord, and their generosity for the ways that they have given here in church and the ways that they give in their own homes to others that are in need continue to be at work through us. For there is still much that we can do. We are thankful for your healing hand that has touched our sick. But Lord, there are still those that are in need of your healing presence, that are in need of finding healing within their bodies. Continue to touch each one according to your will and not our own. Be with our children. Be with our leaders. Be with our teachers. Be with our world. that we may find ways of uniting together rather than separating so far apart and fighting and struggling. We pray for peace throughout our world. We pray that we will turn on the news and hear of the good that has been done rather than another shooting, another killing. This is where we must become involved, where we must take a stand, where our world needs the body of Christ to stand up to be that body in the face of all of the adversity that this world is going through. Surround us, fill us, and lead us in your path, dear Lord. Be with Kitty next week as she will be speaking from this pulpit she may be operating the CD player as well. Help her to remain calm and speak through her. And watch over each one of us until we gather together again. We ask this in Jesus' precious name and call us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, may we turn to our closing hymn, and we may lift up our voices in praise of God. <laughs>
And now may the grace and the love of God surround you and hold you. May God receive the gifts that we offer upon entering or upon leaving this church. May those gifts be used for his glory. Now go in the name of Jesus Christ and be the body of Christ for our world, now and forever. Amen. Amen.